Okay, looks like it's posting up at 12 o'clock for college purposes to get things started. And besides, we're kind of running out of space here. And people are sitting and standing, so we don't want them to be sitting and standing too long uh, for their own end span. So, good afternoon. My name is Mike Hunziker, and along with Professor Ellen Lapson, the director for the Center for Security Policy Studies, I'd like to welcome you to the SHAR School Over Stage panel. Now, I will be the first to admit that Washington is not exactly suffering from a shortage of Taiwan related events right now. But for all the debates and all the commentary and all the war games, it strikes me that there are still a number of important questions and voices that aren't getting the attention that they probably deserve. So I put this panel together as a way to explore some of the issues. So really get at the proverbial devil that's been mucking around in the details of these otherwise big debates about the future of the U.S. I want China relationship. And I wanted to do so in a way that can highlight some of these underappreciated perspectives. So I'm hoping to use the next 90 or so minutes, even though we've gotten up about five of them already, to hear competing views and nuanced takes on a range of questions, big, small, and so things like, does Washington have a good pulse on Beijing's intentions? I think it's all. Is anyone, Taiwan, China, or the United States actually ready for war? If not, what gaps remain? And who is most likely to live first? What is it going to take to deter Beijing? Are American and Taiwanese leaders and equally as important voters willing to put the bill for deterrence? Or is deterrence on the cheap simply too tempting to resist? What should and can the United States do to help Taiwan show up its current cause here? What can realistically Washington expect Taiwan to do for itself? And does Beijing even care what Taiwan does to them? Or is Beijing's calculus to the United States? And by extension, what shouldn't the United States do for Taiwan, either because it creates moral hazard, complacency, or because perhaps it provokes very threat? Sure. Or is it turns even the right lens through which to look at all the problems? So it's a lot to try to get at in a very short period of time, but I honestly cannot imagine a better group of scholar practitioners than the four folks we have here with us today to get at these complicated questions and get at them in the nuances in a way. So it's my pleasure to briefly introduce each of them before turning over the panel and give their thoughts. I'll start here with Paul Huang. Paul is a Taiwan-based independent defense journalist and a research fellow with the Taiwanese Public Opinion Foundation. A graduate of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, Paul has published research in commentaries on military and security implications associated with China kind of rise and a range and done so in a range of Taiwanese and international outlets. His work on gaps in Taiwan's defense and security preparations that has proven especially influential and has gained international attention to include a series of here in the U.S. in the last few years or so. Next up, we have Lieutenant Colonel James Wong. He's a Taiwan-based defense commentator and military insider. Over the course of his career, public of the China Army, James trained at the U.S. Army Intelligence Center, as well as at a prestigious French intelligence academy whose name I won't even attempt to slaughter. James is a prolific author, having written something like 20 books to include one that was just published in the last couple of months, and he's already here in the U.S. doing research for his next book. As a defense columnist, he has contributed numerous commentaries on ET Today and other Taiwanese publications that also explore gaps and challenges with Taiwan's defense posture. We have Elbridge Colby, who is the co-founder and principal of the Marathon Initiative. Sorry to do that right as we were taking the fight. Ah, that's my here. fault. <laughs> so, uh, he's the author, you may have heard of the strategy of denial, which all the journalists submitted in uh, and books on prior to launching the Marathon Initiative, where he served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Force Development. In that role, he was responsible for developing and launching the 2018 National Defense Strategy. Bridge has also worked as the Robert M. Gates Senior Fellow at the Center for New American Security, and he served on the staff of the 2014 National Defense Panel, the 2008-9 Strategic Posture Commission, and the 2004-2005 President Commission on Budget Structure. Finally, last but certainly not least, we have Yu Sun, who is a senior fellow and co-director of the East Asia Program and director of the China Program at the Stimson Center. Her areas of expertise include Chinese foreign policy, U.S.-China relations, and Chinese relations with neighboring countries and developing states around the world. Prior to joining the Stimson Center, Yu was a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution and focused on Chinese national security decision-making, 
And she was also a China analyst for the International Crisis Group based in Beijing, specializing on Chinese foreign policy and towards the developing world. So with that, keep the rest of today's panel quite simple. Paul, James, Bridge, Yoon will each take 10 to 15 minutes to offer some opening remarks on the questions that we've outlined. I would ask that everyone hold all of their questions until all of the panelists have spoken. I may grab the uh, moderator's prerogative and ask one or two questions, but I assure you we will use time to open up questions for everyone else. Finally, please do make sure if you have an electronic device with you, if you could just silence that so as to not interrupt the proceedings. And Paul, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mike, James, which um, is so, uh, like Mike said, a lot of things going on about, about Taiwan that talks about Taiwan, especially in this now. Um, this is the poll that our foundation did publish just weeks ago. We asked how many public. What happens tomorrow? Which side is the base of the win? That's the one third of the company have confidence in our victory. The one percent said China will win. It's confident. Uh, after all the resources, after all the uh, efforts we've spent, this is the level of confidence that the people of Taiwan have. On the other hand, we also ask about Ukraine. And this poll was done in early September. So even before Ukraine's uh, very successful counter attack uh, offensive, uh, we have an after that. So if you could vote, the uh, number of even um, higher on the Ukraine side, Chinese are more confident in Ukraine winning this war in Russia than us winning this potential war with China. Um, a lot of reportings about how. Taiwan is supposed to learn from Ukraine. Just as the week yesterday, I think 60 Minutes, C, uh, CBS have uh, a documentary about it as well. All these recordings, they follow a very similar line that Ukraine showed Taiwan how to win, how to defeat against a larger adversary. And the narrative is always that Taiwan is learning that lesson. Now, I'm going to tell you that is a complete falsehood. Nothing can be further from the, uh, the truth, from what we observe on the ground. Let's just look at how, you, how Ukraine, how Ukraine pulled off this, um, in, uh, this year. One thing, they reformed, they changed <clears throat> since 2014, the euro Madan revolutions, a sweeping uh, reorganization, reform, the restructuring of their senior political military leadership. And that was understandable because the the yeah, other regime was overthrown. The new President Poroshenko and later um, Zelensky, they allowed, they supported the ch necessary changes in the military. Um, the old guards were um, expelled, were just left on their own uh, accord. Young officers, volunteers, many of them four years uh, in the front of uh, the Novas and the Hans, they grow those valuable lessons and then they change the, the military from bottom to the top. And, the, and if you look at Ukraine's military on the hardware side from 20, February 2022, it wasn't so much different from the military of 2014. It wasn't the same, it wasn't the weapon, it wasn't the platform that changed. It was the people, the organization, the leadership, the institution, the way of them doing same that's really changed. Now, I'm going to argue Taiwan that none of these conditions Russia also made a lot of um, strategic and tactical blunders, failed to do, deploy their um, air force, their advantage in long range uh, precision firepower and munitions, very uncoordinated attack, strategically and tactically, um, numerous mistakes in their war planning, in their logistics, and you will see um, massive shortcoming with them with their, uh, their preparation, their logistics, the trainings, pretty much everything. Um, I would say none of these mistakes are going to be repeated by the Chinese PLA. For one, they are not even the same creature to begin with. And after this conflict, you can be sure the Chinese will not repeat what the Russians did. 
that's that's some reality of Taiwan's military in 2022. Taiwan's Navy of 26, 27 major combat uh, service ships. They have none of them have what we call the vertical launch system. A silo they can on the ships they can launch missiles that that independent that's um, fail redundant of uh, that, that that can uh, deal with situation attack. Taiwan's Navy ships in 2022, none of that. The standard naval doctrines of Taiwan's Navy call for um, escaping the ports as soon as possible after the mis after the first uh, the conflict starts um, to the high seas and the Philippine seas. So suicide, basically suicide against the PLA Navy and the Air Force in 2022. They would walk right into this a trap in which they have no modern equipment to fight against these uh, massive POA advantage in air and sea. The RC Air Force, Taiwan's Air Force, a very well known problem that the POA rocket force, the ballistic missile, and other long range munitions rockets are going to take out the runways of all of Taiwan's uh, air base runways. According to Taiwan's own study, they only take a fraction of, that, of their missile to do their job. And after that, Taiwan's Air Force will cease to function. As, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as a factor, that no matter how many jets, 500 fix, uh, F-16, 1,000 F-16, it doesn't matter. No runway, no air force. Taiwan's army, which I served as a corporal 10 years ago, that I would argue, many will argue, is the one in the worst shape in Taiwan's military. Um, massive problems in their logistics, in their training, in their organizations, very outdated doctrines, uh, structure, um, their practices, um, one of which I would like to particularly want to highlight, you see in the, their Han Guang exercise, which is Taiwan military's largest exercise. If you do a simple Google, Taiwan military artillery exercise or fire, Google images, you see hundreds, if not thousands of images of tanks, howitzer artillery, even cell propelled artillery lining up along the coast firing into the sea. It's year 2022, ladies and gentlemen. This is a military, they're doing things that not even, not even the Japanese, not even the Germans in World War II, they were stupid enough to do that. The lesson you learn in Iwo Jima, in, in Okinawa is that you don't put artillery pieces, you don't put your tanks in exposed position if you expect amphibious attack, especially when your adversary have complete air and naval supremacy. You put tanks, you put officers there, that's suicide. That's the way time military doing its exercise today. There's also zero deployment use of drones in Taiwan's artillery, army units, infantry units. Now I, I fact checked that last, um, just yesterday with many of my sources. The only units in Taiwan's military that have drones are special forces. Think about that. Taiwan's artillery have zero drones. Even after years, we saw the conflict in Azerbaijan, uh, Armenia, in Ukraine, how, uh, how drones, especially reconnaissance small drones, have fundamentally revolutionized artillery warfare in fire corrections, pinpoint the enemies. Um, Taiwan's military has learned none of that lesson. Taiwan's military reserve, of which I have wrote, I've written about, and just a few months ago, I got called back for a week long Reserve training observed in first hand, a complete leg of trainings, the uh, very substandard, um, if, uh, if not totally uh, failed, the standard in things like there's, there's no training in uh, combat first aid, infantry, back, basic maneuver and tactic. Um, also, there was no training in, say, radio, in operations of uh, more advanced weapons, the things that people talk about. Say this asymmetric warfare, anti tank missile, anti air missile, none, there was none. And there was also no specific training for what's supposed to be leadership, the MCO, the North Commission officers and the officers. They have no other training and they're supposed to form up these tens of thousands of troops, infantry troops, on a very short notice. On a very short notice. Um, something that we also can learn from Ukraine the Territorial Defense Force, of which many people talk about, 
but essentially quite mis widely misunderstood that it was it was not so much as the TDM, the Territorial Defense Force, that contributed to Ukraine's success. In, in fact, the, the, re the lesson that we learned was this was arguably that the most of the fightings were done, were still done, and most of the casualties, the damages inflicted on the Russians were done by Russia's uh, regular forces, their, um, their regular armed forces and their National Guard, including the Azov Battalion, the Territorial Defense Force, usually the box, the least trained, the, the least equipped, they tend to suffer casualties, heavy casualties upon first contact with Russians uh, or separatist forces. They are useful as a second line of uh, reserve and supporting troops, but they are not the major body. So let's stop pretending that we, Taiwan can use it. And Taiwan cannot do that in, in any case. The, if you know Taiwan's national security structure, the, military, the civil military relations, uh, some other people that have organized this job, you can see in the triangle of government, civilian government, the national police, the military, there's really no place uh, for something like the TFD to exist. The government, some of the officials, they talk about it, there has been no preparation, there's no bureaucratic structure that can support something like this to exist in Taiwan. And frankly, it's the wrong place to start. Um, Anyway, how is Taiwan learning from Ukraine? Well, just a few months ago in the Hanwha exercise back in July, the Taiwan army, they dug a trench near the coast, uh, along the coast of Taipei, 50 meters from the sea. A, a trench like this. Then they say, according to the Ministry of National Defense, they're learning from Ukraine's uh, trench warfare. This is a complete misunderstanding of what happened. The trenches were dug in Donbass during the eight, long eight year of conflict because the Russian artillery would not directly intervene and fire. And therefore you have this condition that where, where they, the, 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 the small, only the small arms and the infantry and the, 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 the uh, company that produce the, uh, the trenches in Donbass, which are no longer, no longer relevant because the war has started and then the artillery start firing. That trench seems to be useful. And I grew up next to a sea, in a, next to a, uh, in a fishing village next to a sea in Taiwan. I can tell you, if you try to dig a structure out of the sand, out of the soil next to the sea, that thing is gone in two or three days. You are not going to, you, you dig that two days later, that because the soil, the sand, it's just not going to support that structure. Let's look at what the, the, fund, the fundamental problem, which I think in Taiwan's military, in the U.S. military, the DOD, the force planning process tends to go to start from the top. What's the problem? What's the threats? What's, what, 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 what things that we need to be fixed? What, um, the strategy, what strategy that should we, should we adapt? What's, what problem should we fix? And then only after that, you start going into the solutions, uh, what possible solutions, what missions that we need to fulfill, uh, what kind of specifications, what conditions that we need. And then finally, when you have a proposal, it needs to be validated. It needs to be verified by competing team within your, your decision-making process. That's what we call the team rating analysis, something that Taiwan never exists in Taiwan. Um, only after that, you go into procurement, actually buying that producing that weapon, that should be the last step in a, in a rational scientific force planning, in a force planning um, process. In Taiwan, however, it goes the, and the other way. The different branches of the military and different factions in the branches of the military, they come up with their own needs. They say we need tanks, we need artillery, we need new stop, we need new jets, we need new ships. Where's the strategy in all this? None. These branches of military, these factions, they have no, they come up with that, and then the MMD doesn't do the brainstorming. You do, instead, you do recall the like negotiation table where different factions, they fight for resources. Resources mean they have promotion, they have um, new units, uh, new formations, which means power and um, prestige in the, in the structure. That's how Taiwan's military force planning is done. There's no consideration to actual strategic needs. 
and which is why we see the latest share of Taiwan Commission just two weeks ago was an amphibious assault ship. Instead of when, when the number of Navy's uh, frigates and destroyers and corvettes have a VOS, they spend the resources building an amphibious assault ship. Where, where, are, they, where are they going to attack? <laughs> now, and the asymmetric warfare that people talk about, the US experts talk about that Taiwan, that this is a major body for Taiwan, which I, I'm very doubtful. The weapons that have been sold to Taiwan is such as the harpoons were sold for six, the latest arm cell was 46 million per missile. The China, they sold the CAO2, the comparable end national missile, Venezuela, for a fractional price, it's 360,000. Are the example. And by 10 missile, the Japanese, people talk about how Ukraine uses it to great success. But look at the price tag, 200, almost 250,000 US dollars versus China's latest. And what they, they complain, the PLA and so complain to be very expensive, HJ-12. Quarter price, 18,000 US dollars. Why do I show this thing? We need a fundamental rethink of strategy, not just adding equipment. The also, the, according to many of these reporting, these commentators from the US side, the solution for Taiwan's defense problem is always the introduction, the addition of more weapon, more hardware. This cannot help. The problem is institution, this organization. If you add more weapon, you make all, more stuff to this dysfunctional mess. You are only going to exacerbate the existing problem and worse that you are only going to lend legitimacy to an organization that's failed to adopt the change, adapt to change. And they're only going to use those new stuff, put them into the same stupid positions, such as by the, buying the pounding, self propelled artillery. Where do you think they're going to put it? They're going to put it on the beaches, on the coast. How would they demand that they have piloting or the older uh, artillery? They're going to annihilate it in the first minutes when Chinese um, frigates and corvettes start firing their naval gun from 30, 30 kilometers away. The civil military relation also needs facing. Um, there needs to be greater accountability out of Taiwan's Ministry of National Defense. But that, I would argue, none of these changes are possible as long as Taiwan's leadership. Then the president of Taiwan that has not shown no willingness, no commitment to change. Instead, we have seen every gesture, every effort to put up public relations display, say that the things that they say they change, taking a trench next to the sea, putting more artillery firing into the sea and showcasting to foreign media. When any trained military expert any defense and serious defense journalists, they look at this and they would, they would, uh, they, they they would see they they would see what it, it for what it is, but this is the reality that uh, we have in Taiwan. With that, I'll turn to James. Thank you, guys. This is a, a very serious uh, topic. I will be here to express my uh, not a new idea, but real. The first thing is that I want to focus on our training because training is the basement for everything. But from our active troop, the training efficiencies. Pretty low. The best things are in the manpower. Since our all volunteer system start from the 2004 teams, we expect the tiny but might force never happen. And the situation is from bad to worse. Why? Now we have to. Rob Peter to pay Paul almost every ring. 
because a few years before our legislature <coughs> passed uh, the withdrawal mechanism. That's why in five years, more than 16,000 volunteers quit from our military. It's a totally training resource waste, about one five. This situation caused our, our recruit and our quality of military manpower getting lost. That's our score criteria. If you are not the last one third, you can apply to a military academy. But we want to the best. In fact, we can. And the rate of registering about uh, 70 to 80%. In our TC system, also the same. From 2018 to 12 uh, to 22, the acceptance rate is almost 90%, but the separation rate is 35%. This is our training cycle. Most of our most of the foreigners this didn't know our training cycle. That's why. Now in our island, try to urge to extend the, the service term, per service term from four months to uh, maybe one year or, or two years. This, as we call boot camp training, four months, separate, too fast, five weeks and plus 11 weeks. After that, if you are volunteer, you have a chance to enter the station training and uh, uh, rotation training and then move into a training base. Then you have a chance to into a joint uh, operation validation. That's in local some south of Taiwan, Pindong. That's why the CNN news report is a joke in, in, in Taiwan. Why? Because this is not a scenario connect with any PRA event. It's our routine train for life fire evaluation. And then we also know the NATO nations they have in, in a recruit training about 15% will kick out. They might uh, retrain it again or just go home because the army cannot accept unqualified soldiers. But in our system, it's totally different. This is the course, a training course in the first phase of five weeks, total 169 hours, divided into four parts. In the first phase, almost about 15% fail the test. And into the second phase, 10% will fail. But the question is, whatever you pass or not, you just go home after four months. So nobody care how good the training you will. That's our boot camp range course. We have more than 100 ranges, including the different service. But how much bullets for each recruit? You can imagine during the four months. I zero. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's too bad. <laughs> huh? 72. Uh, Maybe correct because yeah yeah yeah. Any question? No. Minus eighty six, but this one is perfect condition. What I mean, perfect, it's gonna never happen. The active is worse, but our the the active is bad, but the reserve is worse. You can see the. Uh, it just the number of registered in, in every year 
by the qualified soldier of the number is about only 34%. We just put the money and waste it. That's our new plan for this year, as we call new reserve recall training expense. The funny thing is, how can you imagine for every trainee, for every reserve, the training fee is only $12 per day. How can you use $12 per day to train a soldier and expect that will be a good one? Well, this number is the, the ammunition for different kind of uh, weapon. A pistol, rifle, machine gun, mortar. As I saw, as I told before, very perfect condition. This year, we spent a two billion new time dollar to buy any kind of ammo, and next year we will spend almost eight billion to buy any kind of ammo. This is four times. And the Hang Wang exercise is a self amused shore, ready in shore, whatever. We call it, it start from different places in simultaneously. It's a joke because we don't have the capability to, to do this. <laughs> you see any? Uh, Spatial things, even in the exercise, our officer, our NCO cannot carry the pistol. It's only a host, holster. Even our, our pistol is an M1911, very old uh, grandfather class. Do you think that we are trained for fight? No, we just play for fun. Uh, here's the link of this video. If you have interest in, you can see this is the ADA gunner. It's the operated machine. It's player firewall. And our war game, using the war game is a rent zone, totally wrong in our system. It's only a recitation contest because everyone will get a manuscript and you just read it. No more action, reaction, under reaction because every step is arranged and cannot change. If you are young and try to express what you think, you will be child in YouTube. The funny thing is our scenario design. Do you think our scenario design the best on POA will invade Taiwan? No. We are based on everything with peace and that we will not counter attack in the, the fourth day morning after the exercise start. We are Now we talk about gap. Yes, the unbalance in uh, Taiwan strike is keep going on, and uh, the gap is increasing. We have budget, and uh, almost increasing in recent years. But budget may be put in the wrong direction because. Maybe FMS projects are good, but the manpower is the best problem because we still short of 25,000 personnel in this August. And we are trying to increase 50,000 personnel in two years. That's another problem. Mm -hmm. Don't sell us just 
fighter because we have 85 we have pony rates in senior high school. Since 2011 to 19, our Air Force just trained only 21 fighter pilots. But we have 100 helping we operate. And at this cause, like accident, we are in the rank number two, number one in USA. The fighter and the pilot ratio is minus one, but the average is one to uh, 1.5. Now we talk about the up four. In our army, nobody care about the up four. But you, if you don't have the uh, elite up four, how can training your, your troop more, much better? Another thing is our training concept. This is what I mentioned a few minutes ago. If you sell our paladin self-propelled gun, it's useless because our artillery officer we have used it like a, just like a fixed poison, not a mobile. Look, the gun doesn't have any brand. They try everything to fix it, not a maneuver. The gun is training all the same. Everything set up by the instructor. The gun is just sit in the the sit and the fire. The labels keep staying uh, station to station targets. Well, we focus on the challenges. How uh, many is not only respond, but transformation. Unfortunately, we are in catch 22. For example, on uh, military resources, if we want more, in fact, we don't know how to train and then deploy deployment. But if you less, we will feel incompetent and uncertain. We are in a dilemma. If we change, we'll be in chaos. If we don't change, we'll be vanished. <clears throat> Another thing is we must remove our uh, inbreeding chain because our, in our military education system is very serious about this chain. The soldiers cannot have any creation idea. They just produce yes men officer. In actually, we construct a versus cycle, and in every element, we create a, we create another versus cycle. And the Taiwan can help is a slogan, but <laughs> if Taiwan want to play a proxy war supported by USA, you have to know how to help Taiwan, and what is the first. Not armed procurement. In five years, we spend more than 500 billion to buy any weapon system equipment from the USA. This doesn't make sense because the people still feel uncertainty. Maybe the poor are full of contradictionary and uh, naval invention. I will try to uh, persuade someone. You should put more attention on our training and the doctrine because we are far away behind. And then maybe you can introduce our new concept of any uh, warfare, not, not uh, uh, just expect, expect us to uh, catch on your step. And the last thing is the evaluation system. You know, 
our military is full of hypocrisy. From, from top to down and from down to top, all the same. The full of lies. That's why if we don't have a real evaluation system, any training is not a real one. And I think a politician always say uh, many strategy, uh, ambiguity, uh, reality, or retrenchment. And the uh, same thing also uh, rule uh, many things about uh, strategy, occupy hedgehog, uh, viper, uh, whatever. I don't want to talk about strategy because very high level. My opinion, this is only an illusion. Why? Because well trained soldier is the brand of any strategy. If we don't have the well trained soldiers, this is only an illusion. That's why if you ask this question, my answer is not yet. We are far away behind. So this is the chance for me to hear, to seek any help from Americans. Okay, I'll be followed by school. Thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you to uh, the university for the invitation. I'll, I'll be a little bit more brief so we make sure that we have time for questions and a little more uh, colloquial. <clears throat> Fundamentally, I think it is in America's interest that Taiwan does not fall under China's control. I won't dwell on that. I'm happy to talk about why that is uh, later. But let me stress that that interest is a relative one. I mean, the way I think about it is it's about a 70 out of 100. So the United, Taiwan is not an existential interest for the United States, it's an interest in the United States. Because, especially now, given the president's recent comments over the last year or so, clearly other countries in Asia, in my view, will regard you know, U.S. behavior towards Taiwan as a bellwether of how the United States would, would treat them. If you're in Manila, uh, even Tokyo, Seoul, Canberra. Also, Taiwan is militarily significant. It's located right there in the middle of the First Island chain. If China were, were able to gain it, it would give it a much better military position in the Western Pacific. And, you know, I think at this point it's fairly un. Well, it is more controversial than it should be, but Asia is the world's decisive theater. And it seems like China is pursuing a, a regionally dominant position on its way towards global preeminence. Thirdly, you know, there is a uh, the, the concentration of the semiconductor industry and fabrication on the island of Taiwan through, through TSMC is very significant. And that appears like it won't be able to be remediated or diversified for at least some time, possibly a half decade, if not longer. So those are those are American interests in Taiwan. There might be others that you might point to, for instance, Taiwan being a democracy. I think those those two and some extent the semiconductor one are the critical ones. But those are important. But again, they're not existential. So American interests in the island are um, relative and dependent upon the costs and risks of coming to Taiwan's defense. And I think I mean I won't dwell on the point, but I think the Taiwan's own efforts in recent years are exceptionally unimpressive, basically, from what we can tell. Uh, and I honestly find this mind boggling because um, for a few reasons, I mean, uh, I think, you know, logically, the way that Taiwan is most likely to get the United States to come help it, and Taiwan will not be able to realistically defend itself against the PLA. I mean, it's something like on the order of 1 50th the size of China, and it's about 100 miles away. So if Taiwan is left to itself, it's gone. And it should settle, basically, if it's thinking itself irrationally uh, at some point when the Chinese pull the trigger. So its only hope is to get the United States to come in in such an effective way, what I would call denial defense, basically defeat uh, the Chinese invasion uh, in order to occupy and subordinate the island, which I think, as we can see in Ukraine, is necessary to sub subjugate a, a resolute and resistant country. Um, the way to do that is for Taiwan to ensure that the costs and risks of American intervention are sufficiently low that we decide it's in our interest, it meets that 70 threshold for us to come in. Um, Taiwan is not doing that, uh, which is mystifying in and of itself. It's also mystifying because the Chinese are increasingly open about what they have planned for Taiwan. 
which is re-education, to put it generous, they're openly talking about re-education. I mean, that is really surreal to me. The, the, the Chinese ambassador formerly in France, now in Australia, I think, is openly talking about it. And, you know, I'm not, the, Yun and others are much, uh, much more expert on the Chinese, uh, but I know this, that they take uh, a social and political control very seriously. You can look what they're doing in Hong Kong. And Taiwan is much more dangerous of a political contagion if it were to come into the People's Republic than Hong Kong is. Hong Kong has been under Chinese control indirectly to some extent for 25 years. Taiwan has been effectively an independent entity for almost three quarters of a century. So if you're China, you can't have DPP people running around. I mean, those the people will be going to re-education centers a la the collapse of South Vietnam if they're lucky. I think it could be, if, if it were me, I would expect, or my family, I would expect it to be much worse because prepare for the worst, hope for the best. Um, so my question, I put this on Twitter this morning, is why isn't Taiwan spending 10% of its GDP on defense? And I fully agree with you that money is not alone. But I mean, people say, oh, well, we don't have a health budget. <laughs> You're not going to have a health budget after China comes in and sends you all to re-education camps. I mean, I'm sorry to be blunt, but I just don't really understand what's going on. I don't think it's useful for us to be polite and beat around the bush at this point. Now, I, as I, there are people who are saying that the Chinese won't do it. I have no idea what Xi Jinping is going to do. I know Yun has written compellingly that Xi, that Xi Jinping is likely to be more aggressive uh, as he takes his third third term in office. I think there are other reasons why China uh, might be aggressive in the near term. First of all, there's no way it's going to get Taiwan peacefully. It's been trying to do that for 25 years or more, and it's actually gone in the reverse direction. So independence and the status quo are more popular than they've ever been, and the identification of people on Taiwan, according to Taiwan's own mainland affairs council, is the Ch uh, Chinese identity is at the lower, le lowest level and further declining. Chinese are not stupid. I, I surmise the Chinese are not stupid. I give them, I have a lot of respect for them. Uh, so I assume they're noticing that. It's pretty open at this point. Even The Economist pointed it out in its uh, current article. So it's definitely entered the conventional wisdom, right? That they're not, it's not going to fall into your lap. They tried to use economic suasion. That results in the Sunflower Movement. They're probably never going to get as friendly a president as President Ma. In fact, you know, obviously there's been DPP uh, leadership for two, two uh, presidential terms. But even the Guomindang, it seems to me, is likely to be, especially after seeing what happened in Hong Kong, is not going to be signing up for one country, two systems. You'd have to be stupid to do that. And I don't think the people of Taiwan are stupid. So if you're China, you know that. Well, you could give up. <laughs> I don't see any indication the Chinese are giving up, uh, both uh, rhetorically, uh, but also in terms of their military development. They are building a military, first and foremost, to seize and hold Taiwan. Very clearly, check out Lyle Goldstein's Twitter feed. It's very illuminating on this point. I don't agree with Lyle on a lot of things, but the man takes the Chinese military seriously, as I, I think we all should. And they are actively exercising and trying to solve problems. And it's not just experts. Admiral Thomas, the Seventh Fleet Commander, said the Chinese have made material improvements in their joint operations over the last two years. Which Americans like to pat our back that we're better at joint operations. Well, the Chinese are getting better, and it's not entirely clear to me how the United States would do in a high-end war since we haven't been in one really since Korea, or maybe even since the Second World War, generously the Desert, desert Storm. And I, I say that with all due respect, but we shouldn't be assuming, presuming too much. So China's only going to do it if it's going to use military force. And clearly the lessons of Ukraine, um, I think it's evident anyway, but clearly Ukraine shows that you need to use overwhelming force. Don't mess around. If you were thinking that, you know, half the legislative yuan was going to sign on to the PRC, and you were thinking that they, you know, the military was going to defect, as Putin probably did, no. Don't leave any of the chance. Come in and absolutely smash the country, as you said, uh, Paul, um, on day one, and and leave no stone unturned. If you were thinking of sending three or four missiles, send six or seven or eight. And by the way, you mentioned the, the Dongfang uh, uh, family of missiles, but apparently they can cover the whole island, according to my friend Tom Shugart, simply with multiple launch rocket systems now. So they don't. They might not even need their precision ballistic missiles to cover the whole island. In fact, what they use their ballistic missiles for is taking out the American. So some of the things that you said for uh, Taiwan also apply to U.S. bases, including in Japan uh, and potentially uh, U.S. forces elsewhere in, in the region. So we're, we're, that, that's what we're looking at. Now, presumably China would prefer to wait in a general sense. And you know, it could, if it thought it could always do this later, um, it would uh, pro probably wait because obviously invading Taiwan and precipitating a, a very plausible conflict with the United States is incredibly risky. So there have to be reasons why China would decide to move. And in the history of, of why countries start wars, this is an important issue. Unfortunately, I see several reasons why they might decide to do so. One is the shifting 
Uh, China may assess reasonably that its military and geopolitical advantages are higher now vis-a-vis -vis its potential opponents in the Western Pacific than they might ever be. And again, my, my friend, I call it the Shugart window, which is that uh, a lot of the military investments the PLA kicked off starting in the third, third Taiwan Straits crisis are now coming into the force in this decade, whereas U.S. investments, things that we worked on the Pentagon and others, people like Bob Work, uh, will not come into the force really until later in this decade or even into the 2030s, if we're lucky. For instance, AUKUS, the Australian submarines are not likely to come into the water until the middle of next decade at the very earliest. So if you're China, even though you may think you're not ready, um, you may be as ready relative to blue, us, and green, you guys, as you're ever going to be. So the example I like to use, as I understand it, 1939, the German high command opposed the entry into the, the, the initiation of war with Poland and the Allied powers. But Hitler said, we are never going to be re readier relative to the Allies than we are now. And sadly, he was correct. So there's that's the military balance reason. The second reason is the personal calculus of Xi Jinping. The man is almost 70 years old. He's not immortal. He can drink some mercury, but it's not going to solve his problems. So if we look at what happened with, with Putin, probably, I'm surmising, I don't talk to him, uh, but you know, is that his personal calculus and his legacy played something. And that's something else that Xi Jinping uh, presumably would, would, would reckon. Some talk about the impending collapse of the Chinese economy. I personally am more skeptical or agnostic on that, but that's another potential reason. I would also say that countries are starting to wake up in the region, right? Japan is finally loudly starting to talk about Taiwan. It's not going through the formality of actually increasing its defense budget yet, which would be what would be helpful. Uh, but you can see Australia is doing the same thing, right? Uh, Taiwan itself is finally starting to realize there's a problem. So if you're China, maybe you decide not to wait around. I don't know. I don't pretend to know. I don't know what Xi Jinping is going to decide. But that leaves me very worried because if I were doing the same thing I'm doing here in Beijing, I would probably be arguing that we should be really thinking about going soon. And if we're going to go, go with overwhelming force and give as little warning as humanly possible. Why? Because you have to, you have to launch and sustain an amphibious operation across 100 miles of water. So the worst thing you want to do is generate a huge amount of signals let the Americans know exactly what you're doing, get everybody ready so we're all prepped. This is one of the reasons I don't think they work their way up through seizing the offshore islands or I'm skeptical of a blockade first scenario because it primes everybody, at least a harsh blockade, it primes everybody for what's happening. Instead, what you do is the fait accompli. You close, this, you close up the story, you know, in a couple of weeks at most, and then you present the Americans with, hey, I know you said it was a 70 I'm going to make it like a 95 cost to even get back and contest this island. And by the way, it's probably hopeless because once this island's been seized, you're never going to be able to land force attempt again. And the Americans will come up with an excuse and say, oh, the Taiwan didn't have to fight hard enough. They weren't prepared. They're different than the Ukrainians. And we'll come up with a very good legalistic answer. But the facts will remain, right? So that's what I'm very concerned about. And a lot of people are out there. There are people out there saying, we don't see indications, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they just need to be inside of our OODA loop. They need to be able to react more quickly. For instance, they clearly must know we're watching their military amphib, the amphibious vessels that they would conventionally use to cross the strait. Well, presumably the Chinese are aware that we're looking at it because we talk about it all the time, right? So it's fine. But the Chinese may say, well, we can plug that gap faster uh, than uh, the Americans can once we really decide to go. Or uh, we may decide we don't need them. For instance, we might use the Roros and the ferries, which are military grade and huge. They're like 10 times the size of the Nantucket Ferry. Okay. Or well, to use Lyle Goldstein again, they might conduct the, the initial offensive just with air assault and helleborne forces. Maybe costlier, maybe riskier, but it may get the job done. You seize the ports and it's game over. So that's the problem. And, and what, I'm fear, what I fear is that the Chinese have now used the Pelosi visit and so forth to continue to up the or continue to, to adapt their behavior so that we have less and less warning, especially warning that is sufficient enough to cross our threshold to do politically contentious things. And that's in a sense what's happening right now. So Taiwan's fate is in its own hands more than anything else. And that's why I say 10% and you laugh and I know you're on the same side, but like if it were me, I would say 20%. Like, I don't know, whatever it takes and show the Americans that you are serious about it and it, deathly serious and that you will fight hard because otherwise, despite what the president said, I think it's plausible the Americans would back down or we would have a kind of a kabuki thing where we would, or there's some kabuki move uh, apparently where, where the, the defeated samurai does a big thing as he goes off the stage, um, but everybody knows it's a symbol, right? And that's, that's a very plausible outcome. So I think the situation is very grave, very urgent. 
Um, and we're, we're really pushing uh, our luck to say the least. Thanks. Well, these are terrific presentations. I'll try to match them in terms of the awesomeness. Um, well, I think there's a, a question has been asked, is Taiwan ready? And then the question is asked, is the US ready? And then I think the next question to be asked is, uh, is China ready? Well, we know that the 20th Party Congress will be, held, will be held this weekend. What kind of policy will be announced, especially on Taiwan, nobody can predict. Um, but we do know that Xi Jinping has announced his uh, overall Taiwan strategy since late last year. And from his narrative and what has been said from the Chinese government, peaceful unification is still the theme that China tries to, tries to pursue, regardless of how, whether we believe it. Um, but considering the recent escalation of the tension related to Taiwan, the discussion and the preparation uh, about China's use of force against Taiwan is uh, both are ongoing. And I would say that the mainland use of force on Taiwan has different angles and different perspectives and different narratives. Um, although mainland has said that main, uh, peaceful unification is a way to go, it doesn't mean that it has given up the use of force. And at, the, at, the, at this current stage, for the Chinese, they believe their use of force or the stretch use of force is not for the purpose of unification. And it goes to the question that use of force for what? Like, is Taiwan ready for what? Is U.S. ready for what? Um, the mainland will argue that currently their use of force, like the, what we saw with uh, with the Pelosi visit and uh, Chinese military exercises, the goal is uh, is to punish Taiwan independence or the tendency of Taiwan independence. But it doesn't mean that the mainland will not get ideas from it, um, especially in terms of the experiment with things that will be used in a future war for unification, such as naval blockade that Outrage very eloquently elaborated on. Different arguments about when China plans to use of force. Um, Gen Admiral Davidson came up with the Davidson window, which is 2027. Um, some expected or estimated will be 2030. Some say 2035, 2049. Um, John Culver from uh, Atlantic Council did an article last week that even if mainland wants to use of force, it's not going to be a surprise attack because for the mobilization, for the movement of the forces, uh, for the military preparedness, there are things that can be observed as, in, as indicator. Although mainland keeps saying, or repeating this mantra of peaceful unification, very rarely you hear people make the judgment that mainland will not use force, even including the Chinese, because uh, again, like Bridge mentioned, I don't think the Chinese believe that peaceful, peaceful unification is going, to be, is going to be likely. Um, and they look at the eventual scenario for unification, there are more and more voices in China saying, well, it has to be achieved through military means, especially considering the domestic politics ongoing in, uh, in Taiwanese domestic politics and the, the Taiwanese public opinion going further and further away from the, the end game that mainland wants to see. These are the, the tremendous challenges for, for China when they look at the issue of Taiwan. Um, it's very clear that mainland doesn't have a timetable because for Xi Jinping to announce a timetable is like tying a knot around his own neck. What if he cannot follow it? What if it is out of his control? What if China fights and cannot win? So of course, Xi Jinping has the desire to have unification as his political legacy, but he also has to consider if use of force is not successful, then it's not only a matter of legacy, it will be a matter of legitimacy, not only for him, but also for the Chinese Communist Party. Um, two factors really uh, as to the uncertainty for China when China considers we ready. The first one is the result of the war. Under the condition of U.S. military intervention, which has been made clear by President Biden, can China win? And that's a fundamental question. So I think the Chinese calculation about whether they will use force is not based on whether they think Taiwan is on their side. It's not about whether they think that Taiwan is going further and further away. It's actually about whether they believe they can win. Because if they fight and they fail, there's no point. Um, so to take the risk of losing not only legacy, but also legitimacy, that is not a, a logical choice for Xi Jinping. And that is, a, I would say, a fundamental difference between China and Russia coming to their strategic culture. Um, recently, there are more data points coming out of China, especially uh, including senior Chinese diplomat 
um, saying that even without the use of nuclear weapons, China can still win. But this is a relatively recent uh, voice of confidence that needs to be needs to be reassessed. And then that gets to the second factor, which as to the uncertainty for the Chinese, which is the cost of the war. And even if mainland China wins in the end, what about the political cost, diplomatic cost, economic cost? And I also have find Taiwan's um, calculation kind of baffling in this in this regard, because even if Taiwan can be ready to fight a war with China, wouldn't Taiwan be burnt to ground in a war scenario? Wouldn't Taiwan be the first to, to fall? Um, so again, coming back to the, the cost for China, a war over Taiwan with the United States could potentially reverse what the Chinese believe that it's already confirmed the prospect of China's rise. And against this tremendous cost, I would say that the decision to launch a war is not an easy one. And the result of the Ukraine war certainly does not support that, uh, that prospect, or at least will give them pause. Does Taiwan understand this, or does U.S. understand this? I think both U.S. and Taiwan understand this, and it is precisely because they understand this, um, there are opportunities, and there are space to push the envelope. And under the in the context of the great power competition, Taiwan, no matter what, is uh, is a strategic asset or strategic leverage of the United States, and there's no reason to give it up. And considering the will or the decision making in mainland is neither certain nor transparent. So the only thing that we can be certain about is, uh, is the growing capabilities that mainland is building. And that's why the question about whether mainland uh, China will use force is not only a technical question, but it's also, it's not only intelligence question, technical question, but it's also a political question. Tech, if we treat it as a technical question, then uh, like Paul mentioned, then what we need to consider is uh, what is our mission, what is the goal, and what is the proposal to achieve that mission, um, and what kind of military capability or weapon system we will need to establish in order to defeat defeat the goal of uh, of China. But how to interpret the mainland's uh, main, uh, Chinese motivation or the Chinese decision making? That's more of a political call at this stage. Um, as for whether Taiwan's military preparedness is going to expedite uh, China's desire or China's plan to use force, I think it will expedite it, but um, eventually whether China will use force, again, it depends on the scenario or the end game of the war, not how prepared Taiwan will be. Um, so um, Mike also listed a few questions about um, Taiwan Policy Act and strategic clarity. I think Taiwan Policy Act and strategic clarity are two different matters. So some of the articles or some of the clauses from the TPA, from a legal perspective, would pose a challenge to the one China policy of the, of the United States. But if United States violates one China policy, then China's reaction will be to downgrade that diplomatic relations. And the Chinese diplomats have, have already said in different occasions that well, the ambassador will be recalled and diplomatic relations will be downgraded. But that does not constitute a condition or a necessity for mainland to, to use force. And if TPA does get passed this year or later in one form or another, what kind of policies that China will take on the issue of Taiwan depends on how Taiwan will act, not how United States will act. And some would say that strategic ambiguity has never been a part of the official declaration of the U.S. policy on Taiwan. And no matter um, whether U.S. clarifies that it will support Taiwan um, for any use of force or the military planning for uh, by, by China, the Chinese have to assume that U.S. intervention is a given. So another, um, another narrative is that if China knows that the U.S. will intervene, then the best timing to launch an attack on Taiwan is now. There's some, re some reasoning to it, but I would say that for the Chinese, the most important consideration is still whether it can win as a result of the war. Um, strategic clarity, of course, uh, another, another half of the strategic clarity is whether U.S. will continue to uh, observe its, uh, its commitment to defend Taiwan if Taiwan takes the first step. Say Taiwan decides that, oh, we have enough support, then maybe we should have a referendum about our future. Then um, in that case, if China does, attack, uh, does decide to attack Taiwan, then whether U.S. strategic clarity will be conditional or it will be absolute, I think that's a question that has not been answered. 
Um, as for Taiwan's military preparedness or military capability, uh, I agree with uh, with my co-panelist. For very long time, that is not uh, the core consideration for China in terms of its uh, plan to use force. Um, many would make the comparison between Taiwan and Ukraine, um, but I think for there, there are many differences. Like uh, China's population is seventy times the size of Taiwan's, and Ukraine population. Uh, Russia population is only three times bigger than uh, than, than Ukraine, um, and there's also a very large differences coming to their defense budget, coming to the the size of the uh, their military forces, and I think for mainland one of the most important di distinction when they look at the war in Ukraine, they wouldn't say that Ukraine is winning, they say that the West is winning, right? And and when they look at the map, um, Taiwan is an island, Ukraine has Poland. So for the Western military assistance to come into Ukraine, uh, that is a, a condition that Taiwan does not necessarily uh, does not necessarily afford. There's some debate as for why Taiwan develops offensive weapon system. Is that going to maybe that's the amphibious landing the, the ship is for? <laughs> if Taiwan develops def uh, offensive capability, maybe it will give mainland more pressure. Well, it probably will augment mainland uh, the Chinese threat perception, but. Um, China does not believe that Taiwan's military capability can independently um, stand alone and resist China's attack. So the most important as view that the uh, the angle that Taiwan should emphasize, like like Bridge has mentioned, is how to ramp up Taiwan's own defense contribution, as well as how to collaborate more closely with the United States to come up with a feasible defensive plan. But then again, I talked to Mike about this, asking. Whether Taiwan is ready, I feel that it's, uh, it's, it's not really a fair question because we have to clarify what are we asking Taiwan to be ready for, to, to, to do what? To defeat mainland uh, independently or to defeat mainland for, or to hold on or to hold mainland for a week or for two weeks that without a clarified um, goal or mission statement in collaboration with the United States is a, uh, is, uh, I understand why Taiwan is is hesitating to make the change that will that will create the chaos. Because uh, what are we really asking Taiwan to do? So I will stop there. Thank you. So I uh, I came expecting a sober conversation. I left with an ulcer instead. But I appreciate the perspectives that all four of our panelists have offered. Uh, as poor Kim here, my graduate student knows, I've been taking tons and tons of notes. I have tons and tons of questions. I will demonstrate restraint and simply ask one question for all four of the panelists. But in what has otherwise been a somewhat uh, depressing conversation, I want to know, is there a reason for optimism or proposive action and steps? And make that a concrete question. If you were advising the Biden administration today, what would you tell it? What would be one step you would like to either see it take or one step you think it's about to take that you think it should not take in order to help address some of the gaps and challenges we've been talking about? So maybe if we could start with uh, uh, James and, and work our way down. Sorry, James. The only thing that I would advise uh, uh, President Biden, please do not just sell out weapons. Think another software. Maybe it's another way to uh, help us feel more confidence because the weapon is, cannot help us to build confidence. We're training and uh, make our soldier feel confidence. We're trained, will be. If we provide our F-35B, we have no fighters, pilots to operate. Our M1A2 T tank, or or Japan missile, almost the same thing. That's why I mentioned, use another approach, not hardware, but software. Thank you. So if I can, if I were to make one suggestion for the Biden administration that they talk to their Taiwanese counterpart, whatever the way that they give, like even ignoring the questions of whether Taiwan will actually listen, which we know they don't, uh, on the, for the record, they tend not to take these U.S. advice. They never take it seriously, obviously. But to push for institutional, organizational, and leadership reform. 
as, uh, as Ukraine has demonstrated, is possible, is doable. This, uh, this, the only cause for optimism is that war, that the one day, now it, it hasn't happened yet. This so is still time. I mean, there, we can still fix this. You start from now, but if you don't do it, then it will never happen. And then we know what will happen if you're looking at artillery and tanks on the <laughs> along the coast, you die, right? So if they can tell that if, if these U.S. advisors, these officials, senior um, personnel, if they can talk to their counterpart and say, why are you doing this? There's things that they don't make sense. They don't make basic military sense. Things that you can start fixing right now. Um, but I don't think that that, that, that difficult conversation, um, I don't think it's going to happen. And even if it happens at the Taiwan, the, the, the problem is with Taiwan's uh, senior leadership, the political and military leadership on the very top, they don't listen. And they have no one, especially the current administration, that I don't see any chance, chance that, that, that they will listen, uh, unfortunately. Um, there may be other ways. That I think the Biden administration has been attempting some of these, such as resurrecting on sales items that they saw would be on the ice. Unfortunately, they also failed to produce changes. Um, but maybe there are other ways that we could use that could, could pressure changes. Well, I, I, I'll violate the rule a little bit if you're the sufferance, Mike, but I think um, it's twofold. Um, you know, I think the Biden administration is right that Taiwan is worth defending, um, but the Biden administration should actually follow through on its rhetoric and do the things and say. I mean, the President of the United States is four times, including on 60 Minutes, said he's going to defend Taiwan. Why didn't he couple, couple that with a national address about why this is necessary, with the resources that are necessary, with prioritization, the, the authorization, whatever is needed to mount an effective denial of defense in the near term? They're not doing that. They're not doing that. And they, no, this is the thing. Five years ago, when we were working on the defense strategy, it was like people could still wonder. It was still over the horizon. It's here now. Jake Sullivan himself, Jake Sullivan has said it's a distinct threat of an invasion. So they are responsible. They have the last clear chance in some sense. We don't know when it's going to happen. But the best, the most likely way, I agree with you, on, is if the Chinese believe it's possible. So they should follow through and they're not doing that. Secondly, they should put intense pressure on people. I mean, I'm talking, they should say, why aren't they telling Taiwan to fire all those generals? I'm serious. We're talking about a situation in which tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of Americans could be killed. And we're allowing niceties with Taiwan. I'm not pointing at you. You're trying to do the right thing. But like, we're taking diplomatic niceties to stand for the way. I mean, that is the irresponsible. All we're doing is withholding ourselves, and that's the right, that's the right. We should be, I think we should be sanctioning Taiwan. Forget about a free trade agreement with Taiwan. No, absolutely. No, we should sanction Taiwan. Otherwise, if and that 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 will send a signal to them that we are serious. Well, I mean, I'm not, but like I'm serious. This could happen, and a lot of people could die. So I think we should need to make sure. And just and clearly, as you've rightly put it, and I've gotten the impression too, the Americans come over and they say these things and they ignore the Americans and blah blah blah. They go back to their business and they're building amphibious. If you continue doing that, I think we should cut Taiwan off. I think we will have to do that. I don't want to do that. But I think that's where we're heading. Not having the ulcer. Sorry, <laughs> I mean, better to have the ulcer now than die later, right? <laughs> well, I fear for the Taiwanese generals. Yeah, um, good, they should be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Bridge. I think there are a lot of confusions created by different messaging coming to Taiwan by uh, by, by the Biden administration. Like uh, President Biden would say, well, we're committed to the defense of Taiwan. But then the second day you will hear from White House that, oh, well, our policy on Taiwan has not changed. And then people wonder that, well, is the president being undermined by his own staff or there are different messaging? So what do they really mean? So what has changed? So a little bit of clarity on that probably will, will help. Uh, there's a strong argument since the voice calling for strategic clarity or at least a conditional strategic clarity. Uh, I think it might be politically too early for that to transpire, but I think it, it will provide some of those pr pressure and momentum for Taiwan to take more actions as well. All right, terrific answers. Uh, we've got time for a few questions. Yes, again. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very, very sobering presentation. And uh, yeah, I'm getting Mike's uh, ulcer here. But you know, eight months ago, if we had a, a similar presentation with regards to Russian Ukraine before the war started, 
I think that you know, most people were saying, hey, you know, if the Russians go in, that'll be that, that Ukraine won't be able to stand, that the Allies won't help, and the Russians, well, they're very, very clever people, and they know how to do things militarily, uh, as, as we have seen. And of course, that proved not to be the case. Now, I think that you've laid out very clearly Taiwan's weaknesses. I'd, I'd like to hear more about China's weaknesses, because it seems to me that, you know, you know they're developing all these weapons systems and they're doing all these things. But the one thing they lack is combat experience. I think the last war was 1979 with Vietnam. They didn't do very well in that war at all. And I'm just wondering, in other words, like, what happens if they cannot win instantly? In other words, how long can this war go on? What is the Chinese public appetite for casualties? In other words, if they start losing people, and then you know these you know authoritarian regimes are always sort of these put together puzzles. And if you pull out one thing, a lot of things start to unravel. And there's one of the problems that unravel. And then I never heard anyone sort of separately say the words Taiwan semiconductor. This is something that we sort of all learn that that if if sort of like the Saudis and their oil, Taiwan and Taiwan semiconductor, this is why Taiwan is so economically valuable, that this is a vital interest. We can't afford to do without Taiwan Semiconductor, and we can't afford those people on the mainland to get a hold of it either. Does this increase the stakes for the United States and the, and the West as a whole? Because it strikes me that this is something that not that you have, um, and my students don't even know what this is, but that this is something that, that makes you more important to us. I will. So the, the PLA, there are other experts and more informed that have studied this more than me, but I'll just say that with regard to their readiness, that, that they, their combat experience and all that, they, the PLA, the Chinese PLA, used to do the kind of thing Taiwan is doing now. Fire this, the, these fire display, this artillery firing to, firing to the sea, the middle of nowhere, showcast to the media, the middle for the PR, propaganda, they stopped doing this quite a number of years ago. Instead, they have what the, the a huge training center in Indo Mongolia called the Juriha Training Center, similar to the U.S. National Training Center. They do serious training. Um, they put off the uh, R four, which in the China case is, is the blue force, the blue force that's representing the adversary, and they are very, they, those exercises, those trainings. So all these Chinese military units. They rotate, they send, they, they, they do trainings there. They are standards. There were things they're doing there. I mean, you, you, if you take what they publicly reported about the, the trainings they're doing, nothing like what we are doing, nothing like what they used to be doing. They are, take, they are very serious about that. And they are on a whole, I'm afraid, they're on a whole different scale of what Taiwan is today. And well, we know that, like, would those be enough? We don't know. We know we are not doing the kind of thing that we should be doing. I, I can, I think Bridge can answer the meta assessment mm -hmm. question in terms of the capability and the experience. Um, but one thing that the people very often uh, refer to is, is, uh, is the information that Xi Jinping receives. And is he getting the realistic assessment from his, uh, his generals? And I've asked the Chinese generals these, these questions in, in chapter dialogue that, what, are you sure that I can win? That if Xi Jinping tells you to go tomorrow, will you go? And their answer, I, I can share that with you, is, well, well, we will go, but we will tell him what the result will be. And hopefully that he will reconsider. Um, hopefully that he will reconsider was not said, but it was quite, quite well implied. Um, on the Taiwan Semiconductor Chips, I actually think if, you, if, if China thinks from the perspective of the future of the semiconductor chip access, they will not go for Taiwan. Because once you take it over, it's a one-time deal. Mm -hmm. Nobody will sell China parts. Nobody would sell China well, what's needed to continue the operation of fab. So it's not something that China can continuously produce uh, semiconductor chips from. So from that perspective, I don't think the Chinese will necessarily see the semiconductor chip factory is, uh, is a positive motivation for them to attack that. Yeah, I just say I agree with them. And actually, it's a good point on the semiconductor point. I think it kind of cuts both ways and a lot of these things do. But I, I think, um, you know, China's 
70 times the population and um, even let's put a discount of 50% on their military forces. They can just overwhelm it with numbers and proximity and focus. The US, um, I mean, I think that's exactly right. Uh, maybe you said it that, that it was the, it's, it's the West, right? I mean, there's where where is the Poland and the Romania that's supposed to be the funnel? How uh, China's 100 miles, but US bases are hundreds, of, if not thousands of miles. So even if we agree that they're as bad as they were against the North Vietnamese or the Vietnamese then who also defeated us, just FYI, um, <laughs> then that, uh, that, that suggests that I think, you know, quantity has a quality all its own. So that doesn't give me too much comfort. I think we have time for maybe two more short ones. You think you can do all the training for purpose in Taiwan? Maybe the possible to put in on and the strategy of making the best and setting the perfect time to attack While the almost all the best um, countries in Europe. Yes. No, I don't think we need to give up Taiwan, uh, excuse me, Ukraine for Taiwan, but I think our Ukraine policy needs to be genuinely framed such that we can prioritize Taiwan to the need to the degree necessary, which is a, a, a matter of resources. It's a mal matter of military posture and focus. It's a matter of political capital. And I think the reality that we can all basically see is that the administration is prioritizing Europe, despite rhetorically saying it's prioritizing Taiwan. Now, whether or not the Chinese and the Russians or Xi and Putin actually conspired, I do think that Ukraine has become a distraction from, from Taiwan. So in that sense, you know, is the Ukraine war a net benefit for China or, or not, or loss, or does it make them more or less likely to act against Taiwan? I mean, I think you would have a better sense than I. I tend to think it's sort of, there's there's factors moving in both directions. It's probably somewhere kind of in the wash in the middle. But I think if you're China, and it looks, I mean, the official assessment of the U.S. government is that the war in the Ukraine is likely to go on for a long time. Uh, and by the way, that it could escalate. So, you know, that's we're not in a good situation, and what I what I fear candidly is that the administration is thinking that they are going to win in Europe, and maybe could take a loss in Asia, meaning Taiwan. That's my fear, and they'll explain it by saying that the Taiwanese exactly as these they will say the Taiwan the Ukrainians fought for their freedom, but the Taiwanese didn't want enough, and it's like well it's three x Ukraine Russia it's seventy x Taiwan China, but if you're Taiwan, you should be acutely aware that is, that I think that will be the narrative. So the hashtag, the prevalence of hashtags is highly contingent upon the efficacy of the Ukrainian defense. So that's the lesson to Taiwan. People are going to write you off if, if you're not, if you can't stick up for a while. And I think to Yun's point, just to be clear, it's not necessarily, to, I think Taiwan has no hope, but, but except with the Americans coming in. And the United States should be clear, we will come in, it, 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 some things, it's not necessarily a week or two because U.S. forces could be operating from the get-go. It it's more of an integrated, but I think that's an area where more integration, is quiet integration in particular, is very useful about what are expectations to our operations. Move away from, I agree with you, the symbolism about strategic clarity, that's the wrong issue. The right issue is making sure that we can actually effectively defend Taiwan, which is very much a question now. Time for one more. All the studies about the defense of Taiwan, respecting the US military, you have to have access in some combination of countries in the region. You know, it, it, it's variable Singapore, Philippines, Japan, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that are that are really, really, really critical if you're going to fight military operation against Chinese and Taiwan. Um, what the interests of those countries vary and, and the leadership changes. I mean, in you know, the Probably, uh, the, 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 the access issue of the, the military is absolutely critical to you know, defend Taiwan. 
should be what's being pressuring or doing anything else? You know, what your thoughts are? Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, it's great to see you, John. And that's, yeah, you know, absolutely. We should, and with the Japanese, I mean, I was in Japan in August and I was saying they should triple their defense budget. And that's what the American government should be saying. And then people say, oh, well, that's not realistic. Well, the Americans are saying you should be at 3%. And now this is just to be clear, there is a, a strong uh, element for, of reassurance involved. It's a, it's a conditional kind of sense saying, I mean, look, if <laughs> Japan, probably the Chinese are going to launch preemptive attacks against U.S. bases in Japan and, and probably even the JSTF as well at this point, if they anticipate U.S. and Japanese involvement. So, and if Taiwan falls, as the Japanese government itself has made clear, that's going to be a huge blow to Japan's security. Okay, ergo, act accordingly. And instead, what we're doing, what, what really frustrates me right now on this issue is that we're taking a lot of, you know, applause, you know, instead of pressuring the issue. For instance, why aren't we deploying ground-based conventional cruise and ballistic missiles all along the, the Japanese archipelago and ideally Philippines as well? Now, there are people... I think there is stuff going on, and Bong Bong does seem more open, and that's good. I think Secretary Austin met with him, if I'm not mistaken. I know General Flynn, for instance, is very focused on this. That's great. But I think this should be, an, I mean, we should be pushing this into an area of discomfort for us and for these allies, because that's the right place to be, given where the, where the, where the PLA threat is. Obviously, you have to be careful. You push so hard, you can jeopardize the overarching relationship. But I think that's the place where we should be diplomatically and geopolitically. All right, our time has come to a conclusion. If you could join me one more time in thanking the panelists. Okay, well, uh, just a quick thank you to Kim, our wonderful graduate student who does all that behind the scenes work to make this possible. So thank you as well. Final shameless plug, hope to see you again at some future CSPS event. And we have some of our monographs and publications out back. You want to grab some and a bottle of Maalox for your trip home. <laughs> Well, thank you. Yeah. See you. you too. You too. I love your stuff. Hey, great. Okay. Thanks. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Gotta run.